I'd like you to take the Word of God in your hand now and open to the book of 1 Samuel and the 17th chapter. This is our 28th sermon in our series through 1 Samuel. The series is entitled, Faith of Our Fathers, Our Flawed Champions, and Our Heart's Desire for a King. One of the great themes of 1 Samuel is leadership and how we crave good leadership. And I think as Christians, we do. We pray for good leaders in our nation. We pray that we would be good leaders in our own sphere. We pray for good leaders in our home, good leaders in our churches. We want good and godly leadership. But whenever and wherever there is a breakdown of leadership, there's trouble, there's problems. And we're going to see some of that today. This morning, we're going to be begin reading about and considering the story of David and Goliath. Our text is 1 Samuel 17, verses 1 through 11, and the title for the message, if you're taking notes, is The Champion. Now, I'd imagine that most of us know something about the story of David and Goliath. It is a tale that's made its way into the pop knowledge even of our modern secularist society. So whenever some little company wins a lawsuit against a giant megacorp, the news will say, this is a real David and Goliath story, that kind of thing. The story of David and Goliath is what C.S. Lewis would call a true myth. Now, myth, coming from the Greek word mythos, which just means story, and often when we say story, we think, oh, this is some made-up tale. This is something that didn't actually happen. The idea behind a true myth is that there are all sorts of stories that are made up that point to a particular truth. So, for example, whether you're reading about Bilbo Baggins facing Smaug or the Pevensey children going up against the White Witch or the wing feather children standing up against Nag the Nameless, you find uh, a pattern. The pattern is good versus evil, but it's a very specific sort of context. And that is that good is small. It's weak. It's in the minority. And the evil is big. It's large. It's the majority. It's very imposing. But somehow some way, by some miraculous and surprising grace, the little good overcomes the great evil, okay? And those things resonate with us, those kinds of tales. We love to hear those. We like to sit around in the evening and tell those stories or read those stories or hear those stories. This is the Greek mythos. It's the story. And C.S. Lewis had the idea, and he's right, that all of those stories would point back to a story that actually happened in time, in our history, in a time and a place. So when we say, well, this is a David and Goliath story about something that happens today, we're looking back to a real event that actually happens. There's a communication of something that is undeniably true through an actual event that occurred in history. In other words, God has ordained an event in order to show us something that is true in story form. Now, there are a lot of true things we could take away from this, but before we read the text, I want to give you four clarifying statements that I hope will guide us as we guide our thinking as we dig through this, the story. So if you're taking notes, write these down, and we'll try to uh, discuss each one just briefly as we go on. But firstly, number one, in the Bible, the devil is not in the details. God is there in the details. The details are important. And what I don't want to do with David and Goliath is just say, oh, we've all heard this story before. 
We were all in Sunday school at one point. We all sat on grandma's knee at one point and we heard this story being told and we know all about it and we could just breeze through. I don't want to assume that. There are so many details in this story and important truths to be gleaned from it that we don't want to rush through it. The details are important. God is speaking to us through the details. Number two, context is king. Context is very important. So often when we hear this story or we see this story, it's just kind of an isolated event. We're told, well, there was a man and he was a giant and he was bad and there was this boy and he was good. And they went out and fought and the boy beat the giant and God helped him and that's the story. Well, no, there's a lot of history up to this point. We've been through a large portion of the Bible already in 16 chapters in 1 Samuel alone. There's a lot of history, there's a lot of context, and there's a lot of things to come. So many threads from Hannah's prayer to the time of the ark down in Gath to the words of of God to Samuel in chapter 16. All of these different threads kind of tie up a pretty bow in 1 Samuel 17. And so we must be able to think back. And those of you who have been faithful to uh the sermons throughout first samuel you're going to find a lot of rewarding things in chapter 17 and that's really a lot of fun okay number three god's people did not get what they wanted when god gave them what they wanted god's people did not get what they wanted when god gave them what they wanted Saul is king over Israel at this point because the people had said, we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles, 1 Samuel 8, 19, and 20. And in our story, like some of the previous stories, we do not find Saul leading the charge against the Philistines. And God had said, Saul will deliver you from the Philistines in 1 Samuel 9, verse 16. But instead, we find Saul cowering in his tent. We find him afraid and dismayed like all the people of Israel. So, a lot of times, God gives us what we want. And we find out it wasn't what we want. Right? God knows what's best for his people. Number four, God is the champion of his people. God is the champion. He is the one who stands in the middle. And while the Philistines roll out their champion, God's people are pretending that they're helpless. This is tragic. The Israelites are pretending that they don't have a helper. And it's sad. It's really one of the most uh, confusing things in life. Uh, I pray for God to open our eyes to this truth. Um, and we preach a God-centered gospel here that teaches that God's people cannot save themselves, but that they are not helpless or hopeless because we have a great Savior. We have a great champion. Now, if uh, we were left alone to face our enemies alone, the situation would be dire. It would be helpless. But there is a greater and more glorious truth than our helplessness, and it is that God is our Savior. He is our King. He is our champion. So when we speak of the champion, well, you'll see here in a bit, the enemy has a champion. But by the time we get to the end of 1 Samuel 17, you will see that he is nothing compared to the champion of the believer. Let's read our text 1 Samuel 17, verses 1 through 11. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side And Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. There was a valley between them. 
And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your book and for how it speaks to us. I pray that you would help us to recognize that there are legitimate dangers in life and legitimate spiritual dangers. And when compared to our own weakness, Father, we find ourselves helpless and we have no recourse but to tremble and to fear. But compared to you, compared to you, they're nothing. They're empty, idle threats. So, Lord, we desire the victory, but we recognize it comes only by faith. Only when we trust in the God who is greater than all things. So we long to trust you. We want to trust you. Lord, we, we are trusting you. And we pray that you'd give us grace to trust you more. Father, bless and help as only you can. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, children, why don't you draw a picture of Goliath of Gath. And I want you to try to uh, put his armor on him. You can look at 1 Samuel 17, verses 4 through 7 to get an idea of all the kind of armor that he had and that he had his shield bearer going before him. Now, don't rush because in my second point, I'll describe his armor really good and you'll get an idea of it. And for those of you who are taking notes, the first point is this, the failure, verses 1 through 3. And this is an introduction to the failure that we see in, in uh, a very real way in verses to come, but it is a bit of an introduction to the fact that we can see the seed of failure in the early verses. The Philistines have encroached back into Hebrew territory. It is obvious that God's people have been unsuccessful in claiming all that God has planned for them. The scene is set. There's a lot of detail given about where it takes place. And sometimes in 1 Samuel, we read about locations and we say, well, we don't know where this is. You couldn't find this on a map today. Maybe it was here, maybe here, maybe here. We're not totally sure. Here we know right where this valley is. We know right where all of these landmarks are. In fact, in my notes, I have a beautiful aerial view of the valley where they had met and the the mountain on one side and the mountain on the other. We know exactly what it looks like today, and we have a decent idea of what it looked like back then. Now, a few chapters ago, 1 Samuel chapters 13 and 14, in the, the valley of Michmash, the people of God fought with the Philistines once before. 
And you might remember that scenario that the, the Philistines were coming, the people had angered the Lord, and, and Samuel said, I'll pray for you. And, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of a different story. This one, in 1 Samuel 13 verses and 14, um, Saul had been given the Spirit of God. And he had been tasked with attacking the garrison of the Philistines. And instead of being obedient, he went and he waited. And eventually they were surrounded in this valley. And this was where Jonathan comes down into the valley with his armor bearer. And he looks up and he says to the Philistines, or he says to his armor bearer, if they call us to come up, we'll come up. If they say, we'll come down to you, we'll wait for them to come down to us. And they said, come up and we'll show you a thing. And so Jonathan and his armor bearer, they clambered up out of that valley. And I want you to notice something. Go back, if you would, to 1 Samuel 14. Because Saul had made a vow. King Saul had said, no one eat anything until I'm avenged of my adversaries. And in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 30, Jonathan says that, how much more if haply the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found? For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? In other words, Jonathan is mourning the fact that they did not do more and that they did not do better. They did get more ground, but because Saul had some self-centered and foolish vow, the people did not get all that God had intended them to get. And so now we find ourselves in chapter 17, and the Philistines are back, and um, it's not a good situation. Notice that this land, in verse 1, belongs to Judah. It does not belong to the Philistines. It is land that God has given to them. They had an obligation to fight for it. And so they gathered. But something that we don't readily see in the English language is that the phrase <clears throat> gathered and were gathered in verse 1 are both verbs in the active tense. And in verse 2, were gathered is a verb in, I'm sorry, verse 3. Well, let me find it. Yeah, verse 2, we're gathered is in the passive sense, the passive tense. Same word, but different tenses. Now, why do you suppose that is? Uh, for my part, I think that it is that the armies of the Philistines are gathered together with purpose, with intention. The five different cities of the Philistines, they're gathering together, they're united together, they have an active goal. It is to take this land from the Israelites. And what we find in verse 2 is that Saul is there, the men of Israel are there, but it is a passive gathering together. And I think the Lord is inviting us to see here a little bit deeper than just our eyes. In the next point, we're going to turn our physical eyes to the champion of the Philistines. But before we see him, notice the leader of Israel. He is not blowing a trumpet and calling everyone together as he's done in the past. He's not taking cattle and slaying them and cutting them into pieces and sending them out to all of Israel saying, this is what I'll do to your cattle if you don't come and fight for Israel. We find a very passive sort of gathering. Saul is not appearing here as a great leader of his people. He is one who has gathered with them. And we've seen, remember in 14, uh, 1 Samuel 14, when Saul is telling the people, let's go, let's go, and they're saying, whatever you want to do, it's your show. And here we find Saul's leadership not being what it ought to be. It's just in seed form here. We'll see it much better in weeks to come. But in seed form, we just see Saul is one of the people who's gathering to address with this threat. He's one of the men who are gathered together 
on a mountain between Soko and Azekah. Now, that's the leadership of Israel. And we are invited to make a contrast, and I'll show you why when we get to the word champion. But we're invited to make a contrast between the leadership of Israel and the leadership of the Philistines. And which one do you think looks more impressive? Well, let's look at the leadership of the Philistines. And there's a lot to be said about him. Our second point is this, the fighter. This is verses 4 through 10. We have the failure, verses 1 through 3. Now the fighter in verses 4 through 10. Now, you might have been standing on the one side of the mountain with the Israelite army. You've set the battle in array, which just means you've gathered. You're all lined up there, and you're looking out, and the other army, you see them across there. And as your eyes go across, it kind of goes like this, and there's some a little taller, some a little shorter. But there's one who looks taller than the rest, and he starts to march. And he gets closer, and he gets closer. And the closer he gets, the more impressive he appears. The closer you get to him, the more you realize he is a towering, hulking beast of a man. And his armor bearer has a massive shield walking before him. And here he comes out with his weapons strapped to his back, his sword in his, his hand, his spear in his hand. He has all of these things with him. And he gets closer and closer and the narrator zooms way up and says, hey, let's get a real close inspection of this man's armor. You say, how did they get all of these measurements? Well, I don't want to spoil anything. But by the end of chapter 17, he's not moving a lot. So they got a pretty good look in the days to come. But here we are, a man who is six cubits and a span. You know how tall that is? As best we can tell, it's about nine foot ten inches. Essentially, ten feet tall. You know, at that point, who's counting, right? <laughs> That's as tall as a basketball hoop in a gymnasium. Can you imagine having to duck so you don't hit the backboard? This is Goliath. He was a huge man. So maybe he's just one of these tall, lanky, spindly sorts of guys. No, no, no. The, the Bible wants us to know no such luck. We're giving a description of his armor, and two things really stood out to me as I dug into his armor. And the first is, it is technologically impressive. It's technologically advanced. There are different kinds of metal that have been used. Listen, if I told you I want you to go and, and make an iron spearhead, go make an iron spearhead, well, you would require a lot of tools, and you would require ore, and you would require skill. There would have to be a lot of industry behind it. Maybe you could go and buy an anvil and a hammer and you could buy the metal, but somebody had to create those things and somebody had to produce those things and somebody had to dig those things out of the ground. There has to be industry and wealth, but it's not just iron. It's brass. He has a brass helmet that covers all of his head, but it doesn't cover his face. Anybody know why that might be important? Don't spoil it for me. Big old helmet. A coat of mail was probably made of brass too. He had greaves on his legs and these would be form fit around his impressive and as we'll see very muscular legs. He had a, uh, a target between his shoulders. Do you know what that is? You're like a Hebrew scholar. They don't know either. It could be one of two things. It could be a piece of, of metal brass armor that covered his throat and covered his neck, which would make sense. Or it could also be a javelin and it hung on his back or a sort of scimitar. I'm not totally sure that word is, a, is an interesting and kind of a tricky word, but it's still impressive. It could be either one and we don't know which. The spear is different from the target 
And the Bible says it has the weight of iron, so it's probably made of iron, and the staff was like a weaver's beam. You say, what's that? Well, we don't do a lot of weaving around here these days, do we? And someone would say, well, a weaver beam means that it was big. Well, no, because it could be a small loom. If you have a small loom, it's a small stick. The weight of the spearhead means it was big. The spearhead was 15 pounds. 15 pounds spearhead. Imagine heft in that. And the beam went along and matched it. The reason it's like a weaver's beam is because it was rolled and smooth. It was round. It was like a long tube. And so it was technologically advanced. We're being invited to notice that this man had some impressive armor and he had some impressive weaponry. He was not a slouch. He was prepared. He was technologically advanced. This was like the tank of his day. All right? Kind of a big deal. The second thing is this. It's heavy. It's all heavy. The the coat of mail that's mentioned is is, uh, 126 pounds. So 600 shekels of iron is nearly 15 pounds. So we have that in our mind. The coat of mail is probably about 126 pounds pounds so this giant was not only tall he was he was physically imposing he was powerful he was muscular and i was thinking boy how could you walk around with that well you know the average marine carries about 75 to 150 pounds of gear on him on a mission so this is what goliath is doing the 15 pound spearhead with the beam he has his weapons, he has his, his, his uh, coat of mail, his greaves, his helmet. He may have had 150, 175 pounds of gear on him. This is not impossible. It's not undoable. But could you imagine his legs? His legs like tree trunks. His shoulders, his, his biceps, you know. It's a big guy. A hulking dude. And this isn't like, you know, Dwayne the Rock Johnson who, who's juicing. Okay? This is a guy who has not spent his life in the gym. He has spent his life fighting other men and killing them. This is a beast. A hulking, impressive beast of a man. And in front of him is his armor bearer probably similar to Jonathan's armor bearer. He would carry the shield and he would go ahead of him to protect him. He would go behind him to serve him and it was probably a big square shield and he'd carry it like this and he could protect his, uh, his soldier. Now, before we go on, I want to notice three things about this Philistine. Number one, he has a history with Israel. The Bible sh- makes sure to remind us he's from Gath. And Gath pops up a lot in 1 Samuel. In fact, it's going to pop up a whole lot more in the life of David. But Goliath is from Gath. Depending on his age, his parents would have been there when the ark came through. He may have even been a very little boy when the ark came through. He might remember when I was little, the ark of the God of the Israelites came through and damaged us and hurt us. The men died because of the plague, and they rightfully knew God worked that plague there. He was most certainly there when God worked for his people in 1 Samuel 7, and that's where Samuel sets up his Ebenezer and says, Hitherto the Lord hath helped us. And in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, this is after God thunders from the clouds and discomfits the people, and they defeat the Philistines. The Bible says, And the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron even unto Gath. And so he probably remembers times and he's heard stories 
about his people being at war with Israel and being defeated by the God of Israel and being subjected to the people of Israel. And because of this history, we know he has an ax to grind against the God of Israel. But we're also reminded that the threat that the Philistines posed to Israel has often been subdued, but it's always been imperfect. It's always been partial. It's always been temporary. There has never been a thorough victory against the Philistines to this point. Number two, Goliath is set forth as the exemplary Philistine. He's the ubermensch. He's the superman. One of the things the author does in 1 Samuel 17 is that he does not use Goliath's name very often, which I found interesting. He only calls him Goliath twice. The other 20 or so times he refers to him, he refers to him as a Philistine. The Philistine. I mean, Goliath refers to himself as a Philistine. The narrator refers to him as this Philistine, the Philistine, that type of thing. He's introduced to us as a champion. And champion is a great word. It's a really interesting word. Uh, It comes from the Latin word campus. That's ancient Latin, campus. Comes into the medieval as campio. From campio, it comes into the English as champion. It just means a fighter. One who makes war. One who fights. That's champion. But the Hebrew word, I think, is even more interesting. Now, I know it's Sunday morning, and I hope you put some thinking caps on because this is going to require a little bit of, of, you know, just grab on and hold on. Don't let go until we get to the end. The champion is ish benaim. Ish benaim. It's a compound word. Ish means the man. Benaim means in, in the space between, in the middle. The man of the space between. And We're invited here to compare this ish benaim in verse 4. There went out a man into the space between, which, which is where you send your chief fighter out to make the challenge, with the ish Israel in verse 2. You have the men of Israel, ish Israel, and then you have the ish benaim in verse 4. You have all the men of Israel lined up over here. You have all the Philistines over here. And you have the Ish Israel, the men of Israel, which means a lot, by the way. These are sons of Jacob, the man who wrestled with God and prevailed, whose name was changed to a prince with God. These are the men of Israel. Unstoppable is their God, and they park because of the ish benaim, because a man steps out into the space between. It's interesting. One man stops the whole thing. Isn't that something? Isn't that interesting? One man stops the whole army. I hope you get that picture in your mind. Because the idea here is not necessarily that all of the men of Israel were were dumb. They were being foolish, for sure. But it's not that they weren't able to think. He comes out and says, Am not I, not the Philistine, am not I the ruler? No, no, no. He says, I'm a Philistine. I'm representative. This is the kind of people we are. We're free people. We're strong people. We do our own thing. One man, I can step out and I can be a champion. Listen, and look at you. You're Saul's slaves. Look at you, you're subjugated. Look at you, you're kept down. You're pressed down under Saul. And he says, I'll give you an invitation. You can come over here and be our slaves instead of being his slaves. But not me. I am a Philistine. 
You see, he is all of the nations that God's people wanted to be like. That's what they desired. That's what they longed for. And that's what God refused to give them. The battle here is not between the Israelites and the Philistines. It is between the Israelites' champion, the Israelites' Ish-Benaim, and the Philistines' Ish-Benaim. Put someone forward. Who do you have? Who could conquer this Philistine? In a few verses, David is going to step out onto the field. But he is no champion. He's an ish Binaim. But he understands their champion is bigger than Goliath. In chapter uh, 17, verse 47, he says, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And you know, we have the blessing of having many great Christians in the world. We do. We have a lot of great Christian teachers and leaders, pastors, missionaries, and Christian workers in our history and even in our world today. But every Christian knows we have one champion, and it's the Lord. We have one champion, and it is Jesus Christ. He is the Ish Benaim. He's the one who stepped into the middle and fought our battles for us. Jesus took on flesh. Jesus became our mediator between the holy God and us as sinful humanity. There is only one man in the middle for us, and that mediator is the man, Christ Jesus. He is our hero. He is our champion, and he is undefeated, and he is undefeatable. There is no one like our champion. So the Philistine has a history with Israel. He's an exemplary Philistine. And number three, he is defiant. He stands in the middle and he cries out for someone to come fight him. When he speaks of himself, he says, I'm a Philistine. He says, I'm my own man. I'm free. I'm the ubermensch, the ultimate human, the supreme man. And then he mocks the servants of Saul. This is a slap to the face to the man who goes to cower in his tent. It's a slap in the face of all who stand with him. And Goliath claims that all of Philistia will subject themselves to Saul's leadership if anyone can beat him. But the threat is, if not, you become our servants. Now, how should Israel have responded? How should they have responded? We'll see in a little bit, David has a right response, doesn't he? And and I don't want to spoil it, but David goes out and wins. So I don't know if you knew that, but he has the right response. He says, the Lord delivered me from the bear. The Lord delivered me from the lion. The Lord will deliver me from this Philistine. He says, you know, we already have our Ish Benaim. He's here with us, so it doesn't really matter which one of us goes out. God's going to give us the victory. Oh, don't you like to see faith in a young man? Don't you like to see faith in a person? David recognizes the Philistine picked a fight he can't win. He picked a fight that it is impossible to win because he picked a fight with God's people and to defy God's people is to defy God and that is a fight you are sure to lose. We serve the true and living God. Our God is mighty to save. He is the great defender. He is the ultimate deliverer. He conquered all of our enemies. Sin, death, Satan, hell, everything that is opposed to the Christian our champion has conquered. He went to the grave. And while he was there, he carried our sin to hell and he stomped Satan's head and then he rolled the stone away and he came out victorious three days later. And now he leads his people from victory to victory. There is nothing that the uncreated God did not create and there is nothing that the risen Savior has not put under his own feet. Goliath is big, but he's a big dummy. Goliath is huge, 
but he's a huge moron. Goliath is gigantic, but he is a gigantic fool. And so is everyone who defies God. And we hope to see Israel step up. And our first point is the failure, and the second point is the fighter, and we want the third point to be the faith. Yes, let's see some faith in God among God's people. Let's see one of God's people say, we'll trust him. But verse 11 is not the faith. It is the fear. And that's our third point, the fear. The scripture says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And this is truly a failure of leadership. Saul showed his weakness here when it mattered the most. Instead of being a man who trusted in God Almighty, he was dismayed. The word dismayed means to be shattered, to be broken into pieces. I remember when we first bought our RV, we did all this work on it because we're going to take it cross country. We'd never done anything like that before. I'd never slept in an RV and I bought one. I'd never driven one and I'd put down cash to pay for one. What was I thinking? I'm thankful for Brother and Mrs. Black. They gave us, uh, Ron and Tara, they gave us so much help trying to sort that thing out. And then we drove it, I think, a total of maybe like 10 miles before we drove to California. What were we thinking? Well, anyways, we got on the road, and day one, we're, we're, we were close to Minnesota, weren't we, when the tire blew? We're in Minnesota. Boom! And the tire blows, and we pulled off to the side, and I look at it, and it's behind another tire, and I'm thinking, I have no clue how to change a tire on one of these. What am I thinking? Why didn't I look at the tires? They were old. They were full of dry rot. And when I needed it, and when I depended on it, it broke to pieces. Shattered. Pow! And there it is in shreds. Saul's faith. Saul's confidence. Saul's hope. It came the time when he needed it. And it shattered. Broke to pieces. And what is he? Dismayed. Dismayed. And greatly afraid all that he was trusting in lay around him in pieces shattered no strength no help no hope now we can't say was it the fear in all the israelites that kind of affected him or did it start with saul and then it spread out into the camp we don't know but here's what we do know it doesn't matter because the first duty of the leader is to lead and the Christian leader must lead in faith. He must have true faith in God that can support him in times of trouble. And listen, those around you may be faithless, but you must not be. Those around you may be fearful, but you must not be. It only takes one to make a difference. And Saul should have been that one. And when the time came that he needed it the most, his faith, misplaced trust, failed him. Let me speak to the men and to the young men of our church for a moment. Men, your wife may be fearful. She may be afraid. Your children may not have faith in God. Your coworkers may not trust in God. But you are called to lead the way. You are called to set the standard, to show the way. Listen, God is going to get the victory. Don't make him send in a boy to do a man's job. Be the man of faith. 
and lead as a man of faith who trusts in God. A little girl was afraid of a thunderstorm one night, and she asked her mommy, Mommy, will you stay in my room with me tonight? And mother said, I can't, dear. I have to sleep in daddy's room tonight. And she lay quiet for a minute and then whispered under her breath, the big sissy. <laughs> On a serious note, though, men don't fear. Trust God. Love him with all of your heart. Serve him with all of your strength. Women, young women of our church, hear me now. You may find yourself tempted to be afraid. There are many things in life to be afraid of. The actions of evil men, the loss of finances or health, the well-being of your family, and the list goes on and on and on. And those around you may be afraid, but I want to encourage you, do not be afraid. Your God is strong. Your God is strong and full of compassion, merciful and full of pity. He is compassionate on all of us who are weak. He shows himself strong on behalf of those who trust him. So church, let us trust him and let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And though this particular text is ending on a bit of a sour note, we do know the end of the story. We do know the end of this true story. And we recognize it points to another true story. When you stepped onto the field of battle, apparently weak, allowing yourself to be beaten and crushed, scorned, mocked, and pierced, so that you might arise victorious in power, and in glory. And the story of David reminds us of the story of our champion. And so we look to you. Father, you know our frame. You know that there are legitimate foes that make us fearful. But we look to you that we may not on that day when we need help the most, that we find ourselves dismayed. We look to you because we trust in your strength, we trust in your power, we trust in your ability. Please bless us. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We are your people. And we look to you for blessing and help in these closing moments. And we thank you in Jesus' name.